Welcome to the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Brian Russell, and today it is a special treat and a privilege to be speaking with Dr. John Walton, now retired from Wheaton University. Dr. Walton has been a prolific writer, maybe best known for his Lost World series of books. He started with The Lost World of Genesis, and you can read and check those things out in the show notes. But today, it's my privilege to have a conversation with him about his latest book, Wisdom for Faithful Reading. Principles and Practices for Old Testament Interpretation from InterVarsity Press. This is a fantastic book in which uh, John Walton delves into his ideas and advice for reading Scripture well. He calls it his collection of sound bites that he's com- that comes out of his classroom, out of speaking in churches and answering questions. This is a book that's written for anyone who reads Scripture seriously pastors, Sunday school teachers, interested uh, persons in general. I found the book easy to read and rich. Uh, Dr. Walton has a real knack for explaining complex interpretive issues in ways that are understandable. I love this conversation. We also get into his writing habits, how he's been able to produce so much material, as well as a few surprise questions that I ask him. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I do. As always, if you find this episode helpful, please share it with friends. Uh, Spread the word about the Deep Dive uh, Conversations podcast. If I can be of any service to you, feel free to reach out to me. You can reach me at my website, Brian Russell, Ph.D., or by email, deepdivespirituality at uh, gmail.com. Now let's jump into my interview with Dr. John Walton. Hi, John. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for your time today. Hi, Brian. Great to look forward to this conversation. Well, thank you. Well, yeah, I like to ask folks when they come on, and and you've been, I mean, you just told me you're recently retired now, so this is probably a, a long answer, but if you could just kind of go back and look over your career and just maybe highlight some key moments in your spiritual journey that led you to a, a, a very prolific career in biblical studies, allowed you to write lots of books and also, you know, raise a family all at the same time. So like, can you just share a little bit about your spiritual journey that brought you up to this point? Sure. Well, You know, it has to start way back. I was raised in a family that was very interested in the Bible and theology and church and spirituality and all of those issues. So I was really very strongly raised in the faith uh, and got a strong background in, uh, in the Bible at an early age. You know, when you're a kid, your experience with the Bible is basically learning trivia. You learn all the names and places and And we did a lot of that, Bible quizzing and things of that sort. So I got to know the basic content of the Bible very early. And of course, if you talk about trivia, Old Testament's got a lot more uh, in it in that regard than the New Testament. But of course, we all know that learning trivia is not the same thing as learning how to read the Bible well, how to have it transform your life, how to think about it as scripture. You know, those were all steps to come. But I was always interested in the Old Testament. Um, As I approached college years, um, I was aware of that interest, but had not become aware of any possible career path. So I went to college as an economics, accounting, business major, basically, because I didn't know what else to do and uh, didn't see any way to pursue the thing I really loved, which was Old Testament. And it wasn't until my junior year that I had that, that epiphany moment where it suddenly occurred to me that there was a career in academia in teaching Old Testament. And the minute I became aware of that, there wasn't a question in my mind, that's what I wanted to do. Um, You know, whether I was primed for that at that particular moment and the spirit brought it to mind, I don't know, I can't reconstruct that. You know, lots of people have those moments when they spend a week in prayer and fasting and, and feel like that's how the spirit is leading them. For me, Maybe this is bad to say, but it was about five minutes, <laughs> and I I fasted the entire time, and uh-huh. the, <laughs> and it just suddenly became very very clear to me uh, that that's what I had always wanted to do, and that's the path I was going. So that was that moment in my junior year in college, 
And from there, it's been kind of smooth sailing all along. I've received uh, confirmation uh, in that choice, both in terms of my own interests and the reception of my ideas, the interaction with students and colleagues. Um, it was all pretty much smooth sailing. And talk a little bit about what led you to write at this stage of your career, a book called Faithful, or I'm sorry, Wisdom for Faithful Reading, uh, Principles and Practices for Old Testament Interpretation, which really a series of, I guess, hermeneutical statements that you kind of unpack. And it's written for really anyone, like you said, it's for people that read the Bible seriously, but it could be pastors or lay persons. But what, what kind of led you to write this particular book now? Well, at the stage of my career that I'm at, you start thinking, what's that stuff that I really want to make sure I don't want to die with? You know, there are hills you die on, but you don't want to have information that you die with if you think it can be important. And so I, I'd, uh, you know, teaching survey of the Old Testament for 40 years, um, I, I had pretty much worked up these, what I call sound bites of, of hermeneutics, of interpretation. And so I thought, you know, I mean, some of them show up in other things that I've written, but this is a way to pull all of that together and help people think about a particular methodological approach to the Old Testament and try to talk about why that is important and why it works and what its implications are. And so that's what I tried to pull together in this new book. Yeah. And for those listening, the book's really good. It's, um, I would say it's uh, it's easy to read, but it's deep all at the same time. And so that's a testament to, to Dr. Walton. Here's uh, his skill there. So highly recommend it. Can you talk a little bit out of curiosity? A lot of people listen or like, or, or like to write books or you know try, try to set goals on writing. And, and you've been prolific, um, at least over the last couple of decades. Uh, and you know, you have a family. You've taught a large load at uh, undergraduate level, and I guess at the, maybe at the graduate level some too. So how, how did you do all that things and consistently write? Can you just talk a little bit about your maybe your habits that, that you use that allow you to use your time so well? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because I never had aspirations to write. It's not like I dreamed of writing books, let alone academic books. Um, I'd never really thought of myself as a skilled writer. Um, and um, I, there's that, that famous moment that we look back on in my family when my dad read a college paper that I'd written and said, you know, I mean, to be frank, this isn't very good. You really need to work on your writing. And I famously replied, oh, dad, it's not like I'm going to spend my life writing books. Uh, and that just demonstrates kind of the mentality that I had. It wasn't something that I, that I dreamed of or thought that I'd be good at. And my PhD work um, affirmed that as my advisor basically shredded my material week after week um, and conveyed very clearly to me how much I needed to improve as a writer. He taught me a lot, but there was still a lot to learn. So I didn't, even as I was moving toward academia, I didn't think of writing books as something that, well, this is what I really want to do. But what happened was coming out of my PhD program, I noticed something that wasn't out there and needed to be out there and something that I had developed expertise in. It led to a book called Ancient Israelite Literature in its Cultural Context. Um, I think 1989 or something like that. And it just basically came out of the idea that I really could have used a book like this and there needs to be one and there isn't anything like it and this might help people. And so I did the best I could to write it. And that became kind of my mode. Um, I always see writing as an extension of my classroom. Things that I've taught in class that I found have been helpful to people. Um, things that I've taught in church that I've been found have been helpful to people. Well, let's try to make it available to more people. And that's sort of how I've seen my writing. So lots of it is to the student audience and the church audience rather than to the guild. I've done a few things for the guild, but mostly that hasn't been my focus. So that's sort of how my writing career has gone. Uh, where are ways that I need to extend the classroom, get some of these ideas out there so maybe it'll help people. Who knows? You know, some people won't like it. All right. Um, but maybe it'll help. In terms of routine, 
um, I'm a morning person. And uh, when I worked at Moody, I had to commute, uh, you know, a long commute through, you know, rush hour traffic. And we learned that if we left early, um, we could beat some of the traffic. And so I started getting in early, even in those days. Once I moved to Wheaton, uh, I'm a walk to campus, uh, but still the habit was developed. And I came to realize that I, I, my best writing hours were in the morning. And so I'm in my office at six and get a couple hours of writing in before anybody else is around. And that's my, my main time of writing. Uh, when you know I get to late morning and afternoon, well, then I've got classes and meeting with students and committee meetings and you know all of those things. But I tried to keep those morning hours uh, as hours for writing. And of course, also summers. Uh, summers were times for devoted writing periods. So that's that's how I kind of kept at it, early mornings and summers. And and by keeping at it, have you just consistently wrote again? Obviously, everybody takes a break sometimes, but do you like have a word count that you shot for every day or did you just had time and you just wrote whatever you could on a given day? Yeah, no, I, I don't have a word count target every day. I just spend the time and do what I need to do. Sometimes uh, it's mostly spent in research and maybe mm -hmm. I only write a couple sentences. Uh, other times I'm just on a roll and I might turn out 3,000 words. Um, it's It just varies day to day, depends what I'm doing. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Yeah, and I when I was doing some research um, for the for the for the interview, and I, I didn't realize this, even though I'd looked at some of your books before, I didn't realize that your your wife was uh, trained in biochemistry. And uh, you talked about some of the conversations you have. I know you've also written books with uh, at least one of your one of your children. Or they, uh, so what was it like for you? You teach Genesis. You've worked in evangelical institutions. There's, uh, I mean, well, I teach Old Testament too. So you, I run into this, some of the same questions that you get with especially early chapters of Genesis. And here you have as a conversation partner, a trained scientist. Um, how did that actually help you? And uh, yeah, just talk a little bit about that and how that's influenced your work as an Old Testament professor. Well, that really worked well, and it was an early impetus to be in conversation uh, between Bible and science. My wife would want me to uh, hasten to clarify that even though her training and her graduate degree was in biochemistry, she really did not pursue that as a degree. Um, I mean, sorry, as a um, vocation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but she had the training. She could think that way. She mm -hmm. understood science. And so even though she hasn't been employed in science academia, um, she had all the all the stuff to, to do that. So we had those conversations from the earliest times in our relationship. Uh, more importantly, um, her training in science was one way that developed her ability to research and to think, which were the tools that were really helpful in a conversation partner. And so she was almost always reading my material, um, identifying things that I needed to brush up or think about or address uh, to make clearer. Uh, so her ability to research and to kind of think through what I was doing and talk to me about it were always very key, more important really than her biochemistry, although that came in handy. That's good. Of course, my my kids are are very good thinkers as well. I've written three books with my oldest son, John, who goes under J. Harvey Walton. And um, that's that's been a, a major issue. I've learned a lot in that process. Now, it just sounds like a real uh, blessing. My daughters are still in their early 20s, but I'd love to do something with them at some point, too. I think it's just really cool when I, was, when I found out about you. So it just says a lot about you as a father, too, and a husband. So I think it's really cool. Um Let's let's talk a little bit about the the book Wisdom for Faithful uh, Reading. Um, I loved how you started it off, and and you play around with the word faithful. So talk a little bit about that, just to let people have a taste of this. Why did you say faithful reading over against right reading or orthodox reading or or, or however you want to frame that? Well, I've made it almost a commitment over the years to hold my opinions lightly, mm. to be willing to change my mind, and. That means that even over the scope of my career, there are things that I wrote 30 years ago that I would say, I wouldn't say that today, or at least I wouldn't say it that way. And that's a challenge if you tend to think of your interpretation as right. 
I mean, it's right insofar as the evidence goes and how you read the evidence at, at that particular moment, but she might change her mind later on. And then right wouldn't be the way you'd describe it. And so I liked the idea of faithful, because that's something that I've always tried to be, faithful to the demands of the text, faithful to the authority of the text, uh, faithful to the intentions of the text. And so to me, it's faithfulness that I'm shooting for. And sometimes that faithfulness or that commitment to faithfulness requires that I look back at something and say, no, I don't think that anymore. Um, so to me, the idea of faithfulness gives you that flexibility to come back and revisit things and to see if there's more information or different perspectives or some influences that might change your mind about something. Um, I've got a sign right on the shelf that has my books on it that says, Lord, give me this day my daily opinion and forgive me the one I had yesterday. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's not a stance of being wishy-washy. That's a stance of being faithful, committed to trying to give the best reading of the text that you can at this moment with the information that you had, realizing that sometimes that might change. I love that. And if you would mind just for, for folks, I think if, if pastors or listeners are going to say hearty amen to that. How do you navigate then? Um, again, this is the, these are impossible questions at some level, I suppose, but like given what you just said that scripture, sometimes it's meaning is <clears throat> indeterminate. Certain texts we can be more certain of than others and such. And so how, how do you navigate the, the authority question when you take the stance that you just did? I mean, how do you articulate that? Well, I see the authority as vested in the human instruments that God used to produce it. And I use human instruments to include authors, editors, compilers, redactors, the, the, whole, the whole stream that leads up to what we have in our Bibles that we have on our desks. And so this idea of um, holding authority in as a high value uh, means that I'm accountable. And accountability means that I have to keep doing the best that I can. Um, so the authority is certainly, of course, not vested in any of us as interpreters. It's vested in the human instruments that God used, and therefore I'm accountable to them to express my accountability to God. And so that's what I talk a lot about in that book. How, what are the implications of that view? And really, can you talk about authority without that kind of view? Uh, and I'm, I'm convinced that that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, if we talk about authority, uh, you either talk about the magisterium or you have to talk about your accountability to the implied authors and their implied audiences. And so that's that's what I work at. And to me, that's that's the foundation of authority. Here's the way I say it. I say, I view the text as a tethering post. And I'm tethered to it by the evidence that can be produced, whether by me or somebody else. Uh, and so I'm tethered to it. And that's that's the authority link, that tethered, and so tethering post. Too often I find, in contrast, in Christianity, people view the Bible as a launching pad, mm -hmm. um, and that they, they kind of launch out of it to inspirational ideas. And those inspirational ideas, unfortunately, are driven by imagination. And if you're using imagination, then where is the authority? The authority is not in the text as a launching pad if you're going someplace else. And so I think that that contrast of, of sort of a model uh, can help us to say, how am I treating authority? Authority isn't just because you launched out of it. Authority is because you're tethered to it. That's good. I really like that. Yeah. And I want to walk, just walk through a couple of the principles. I don't want to give your whole book away because I mean, it is, it, I like to, it's, it's sort of like, um, what, what, did, what did, how did you call it? Little aphorisms? Is that the phrase that you use for these, the, the different chapters? Sound that bites. Were? Sound bites. That's what you said. Yeah. I, I really sound like that. Bites. Yeah. That's uh, sound bites. Is, and is I wanted really... to call them all sound bites, but the publisher didn't like that. <laughs> I thought that was too, uh, yeah, too indeterminate. No, it's funny. No, it's, uh, yeah, but that's what makes the book really re readable. Obviously, you have a framework around this, and you move from kind of general to, to specific. You work through the canon and uh, talk about a, your, you know, your, kind of your textbook genre stuff. Could you, 
say something um, just to give people a little taste. One of the, I guess it's, this is the sixth one, once you get into the general Bible section, a text cannot mean, and obviously people push back, folks, students come and they want to do spiritual readings. Um, you know, I do some contemplative stuff, so I do some Lectio Divina, and obviously sometimes that just, you you can get un tethered from the original meaning if if you don't go back and do some deeper studies. So so just talk about that as a principle. A text can't mean sure. cannot mean what it never meant. And what are why is that important? What are some of the challenges to holding that when you get into the New Testament's use of the Old Testament? Sure. And of course that's that's one that I specifically got from somebody else. Got that from Fee and Stewart, uh, which I read long years ago and have read numerous times since. Um, and and they made that point, and I think it's a valid one. Um, that is, if you're interpreting the text um, and it's got authority, then you kind of are tied to what it is that they intended to say. And if every generation and every person can bring out a new meaning, a new interpretation, and consider that to have some sort of authority, we get nowhere except becoming more and more divided over our differences of opinions. I don't know how authority can be maintained in that context. It's easy to account for how the New Testament might draw new meanings out of the Old Testament because they are also inspired and therefore also authoritative. And so we can take seriously what they suggest. But I make the point that even when the New Testament draws out new meaning, that's not because they are trying to tell you what the Old Testament author's intentions were. That's because they are trying to actually extend the meaning into something like appropriation or application or some of those other things. So in that sense, the text still doesn't mean anything different from what it always meant. Uh, but we can see a uh, more meaning coming out of it as the New Testament authors draw it out. But of course, under authority. Uh, if I do that, uh, I don't carry the same authority as Luke or as Paul. And so I have to be careful there. Good. That's good. And that's important because we're interested in authority. The minute our own ideas start taking the place of the biblical authors, we don't have any authority that we're based on. We're back to launching pad. Good. That's good. Um, talk a, a little bit about you do a lot of, I mean, you're most, maybe most well-known, maybe for the Lost World books and, and your ideas about genre and context obviously come out in this book as well. Can you go back to when you first got that angle where you basically give framing principles to talk about biblical text and maybe talk about the student that you had in mind when you first wrote that and how that actually helped uh, maybe a person who maybe was struggling over some kind of historical issue? So I think I can trace my thinking really all the way back into my early grad school work, but it certainly became solidified in my PhD work. I went to Hebrew Union College, which is a Jewish school. And at, in that context, very much unlike Wheaton, the policy was you leave your faith at the door. You don't bring it into the classroom because we had an ecumenical kind of setting, Jewish and, and Catholic and Protestant, evangelical and not evangelical. We just had, had all kinds of people there. And so um, the whole idea was you've got to address the evidence um, and you've got to make a case that even people that have a different faith perspective can see the evidence and can affirm it or you know verify it. And so in that sense, I got used to this idea that that's what we need to do. Um, and now, that doesn't mean that I don't bring my faith into my interpretation. Again, I teach it. I taught at Moody. I teach at Wheaton. And we definitely bring our faith into the classroom. But I, I can't use my faith as my appeal to authority. I can't say this is right because the spirit told me. Mm -hmm. You know, that that can't be an appeal to authority. So uh, I guess I polished my methods there. And as I heard the evidence presented in class, um, sometimes, of course, it was arriving at different conclusions than what I had traditionally had. And I had to figure out how do I weigh that evidence? How do I think about it? And so my methods got sharpened quite a bit 
in my PhD work. And then, of course, I've continued on that path through my professional career. Yeah. Uh, it, do you run when, okay, that actually helps me to frame that out a little bit. Cause I, I know that I've, I've enjoyed your work, the, the lost world. I haven't read all the, the whole series, but like the lost world of Genesis one. And I, and I, and I found that really helpful, especially helping a student that might come into the classroom that just assumes a literal creation account in the, I mean, the old meaning of literal in that sense. And then you give, basically principles that help to frame it against its Old Testament background. And in a sense, it gives a, a student permission to not feel like they lose their faith if they suddenly decide that it's not a literal seven days, um, days for example. So uh, did, did, is that, so that really wasn't the background? Because I assumed, again, my, it was funny, my assumption was you taught at Moody and you're, you're teaching at Wheaton that you were trying to help really conservative students to be able to engage um, um more modernistic thinking in some way, but this actually goes even back behind, maybe even for your own faith development. Is that what I'm hearing you say? It, it does. It it goes beyond, you know, before that. Yeah. Um, but I gradually got to see the value that it could have yeah. for people who are struggling with some of those issues. So again, that's why I ended up addressing it in this series, the Lost World series that again, wasn't written to the guild, but was written to pastors and students and church people who were struggling through these issues. But I had to have the method in place first. Yeah. And of course, the method that I talk about is that if we're going to be tethered to the author's intentions, that means we are tethered to their language, the words and what they meant, and we're tethered to their culture because they were communicating within a culture. The way I express it is it was insiders to insiders. And we have to engage in that insider to insider communication because we are outsiders. And so it was that premise uh, that I was just carrying through consistently. Cool. And once you do that, I found you can help to begin resolving some of these long standing controversies by coming at the text from a different direction. That's good. And over the years, I'm just curious. Since you got Old Testament for you said what basically four decades, are you have you seen a different set of questions come up? I don't know. Let's say the last maybe five or ten years than you started out earlier with in terms of students, and because in some ways when you look at the your your sound bites, they're sort of timeless exegetical truths uh, in a way. But have you have you saw have you seen the questions changing at all over the course of your career that students were asking you at Moody and Wheaton? Absolutely. Um, on one count, I find that students in the last five years or so aren't hung up on lots of the questions that the last generation was hung up on. Um, they're not as concerned uh, about uh, kind of questions about young Earth, and I mean in general. Uh, some still are, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, on the whole, if they weren't raised in that context, it's it's not a big deal to them. And so some of the issues that might have really uh, posed problems for, you know, 15 years ago, uh, they, they just, no, that's not a big deal. Uh, on the other hand, things that almost never came up 15 years ago now are kind of critical issues. Um, so there's much more concern about things like uh, the conquest in Joshua. Yeah. You know, the, the, uh, the morality, the ethics, uh, how could God do this? Those kinds of questions. Uh, there's a lot more questions about uh, slavery. Um, does the Bible endorse slavery? Does the Bible endorse uh patriarchy or misogyny or those kinds of things. Um, and so there have been more those kinds of justice questions. Um, again, 15 years ago, I don't think in a, in a course on Joshua that they even would have raised a question about the legitimacy of the conquest. And now it's the first thing on everyone's minds. Uh, so I think that the student culture has shown considerable change. Uh, as we move from the millennials into to Gen Z and et cetera, um, that that they there is a different mentality and a different set of questions. 
And of course, some of the Lost World books try to address both sorts of questions. What do you, what do you think um, the future of Old Testament studies is? I mean, not way, way out, but like, what's your sense that, you know, like, Andy Stanley uses words like untethered, and there's always these perennial attacks on the Old Testament, you know, given conquest, flood, slavery, patriarchy, justice, all the things you just said. Uh, do you see Old Testament scholarship moving back maybe to more like an apologetic sort of phrase? And, and in a sense, your lost world work isn't really apologetics, but it gives some frames. But do you see it going more defensive or what, what would you see the future of Old Testament studies from for evangelicals or for, for people of high view of scripture, at least? That's a tough one. I'm, I'm not typically very good at looking in the crystal ball of, you know, kind of how things are, are going to go. Um, I, given, given the choice between a Bible that um, promotes flawed ideas as against a throwing away the Bible and just trying to be a spiritual kind of person. Uh, obviously, I don't see either of those as being very helpful, but sometimes those are the only two options that people know. So in one sense, what I'm doing is trying to offer a, another option, mm -hmm. um, an option that says if we work hard at understanding the Bible better in its own context, we'll find that it's not promoting bad things. Um, and that likewise, therefore, it doesn't need to be rejected. And so I'm trying to forge that path. Um, I'm hoping that if that is successful, that evangelicalism will find that as a way forward. But you never can tell. Those are things that probably won't materialize until I'm long gone. Yeah, let me ask you one more question about one of the principles. This this would come out of your genre section, and it's uh, it's the number twenty three. Reality is bigger than history. Uh, can you go a little bit into to that one, just to give folks a, a, a taste of the arguments? Yeah, I think that in our um, in our modern and even postmodern world, um, we've latched on to the word history, especially in its in its empirical sense as being the equivalent of reality, that almost there's no reality beyond history and everything that's reality must be describable or definable in historical terms. And I think that's a big mistake. I think it's a mistake that our culture has foisted on us and that when we adopt it, uh, we are adopting thinking that's going to bring unacceptable results. So I'm trying to get to the idea that the reality, the truth of scripture uh, that's anchored in its reality is a reality that transcends history. Um, that doesn't mean it's not talking about things that are real events in a real past, but our word history today entails a whole lot more than things that are real events in a real past. Um, and so I'm trying to raise awareness about that, um, that the Bible isn't really intent on proving that those events really happened, although certainly it assumes that they did. And I, I assume that as well. But it, it's got a bigger point to make about God's role. And that, for one, is something that stretches way beyond empiricism. And so the Bible certainly wouldn't want to be locked into an empiricist worldview, and I don't want to be either. So I'm trying to uh, open up the discussion a little bit. That's so good. If you see, if you could correct one mistake that you see uh, pastors or just or commentary writers or devotional writers making with the Old Testament, what what would the what what do you see the most glaring error uh, in terms of interpretation? Well, this is a pretty controversial one, and there's a chapter on it in the book, and that is that I find that many people in the churches, and sometimes even pastors, still aren't altogether clear what to do with the Old Testament. Yeah. And in that confusion or uncertainty, they feel like they can salvage it by making it all about Jesus. Now, you know, I'm a big fan of Jesus, and, and I, I certainly don't want to undermine the significance of Jesus. 
as the central figure in God's plans and purposes. But they're going beyond that to a hermeneutic. And it's a hermeneutic that's well-worn in the eras of church history, mm -hmm. but that usage also needs to be evaluated and examined. And uh, so I feel like often that's almost a default, sometimes a denominational default, um, that you know, when you're confused by the Old Testament, just come up with something about Jesus. But see, that's a problem. Come up with something. Again, we're ending up with the launching pad model Mm -hmm. where it's our own imagination or somebody else's that we like, that becomes the foundation. Uh, there's no sense in which the authors can be thought to actually be speaking of Jesus in those Old Testament texts. No, the stone that Jacob used for a pillar, pillow is not Jesus. There's no reason to think that it is. And nobody ever says that it is in the Bible. So again, if we're tied to authority, we have to be tied to the author's intentions. And that means we're going to have to stop doing as much as we do, or at least the way we do it, when we try to see Jesus all through the Old Testament. Again, that that was um, unnuanced, <laughs> my brief statement there. And I hope people will read the chapter and see kind of what's behind all of that. No, no, I think that's really clear. I think that I think that was uh, I think folks will pick that up. So I was curious. This was lead to a bigger question. This will, this will be the last big question. Then I'll do the the shorter questions that I, that I sent you. So with your whole your whole project, which again super helpful, you're you know you've talked about launch pad versus being tethered. I'm curious, what's your conversation with? like say systematic theologians, whereas it's your, your own style of biblical theology, very descriptive, very tied to authorial intent. And, and I'm with you on that. But then, you know, sometimes people characterize systematic theology as filling in the gaps or whatever. So like, what would you hope a systematic theologian who's trying to make bigger pronouncements say, speak on something that maybe the text isn't clear about? What, 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 what would you what do you, what, what would you hope a systematic theologian would get from your work? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I don't find myself at odds with traditional theology. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I I am largely a conservative theologian, uh, even if I'm not a traditional exegete, <laughs> if I can make that contrast. Um, so I'm not really arguing with them about the shape of theology. Maybe on one or two points we could have a discussion, but but I would hope uh, that a theologian who's committed to an anchor in exegesis might purge some of the proof texts. Mm -hmm. That is, I'm not asking necessarily to change the theological conclusion, but there's a lot that goes into that conclusion. Uh, Old Testament and New Testament, but also the history of theological thinking and philosophical thinking and logical thinking. It, there's just, there's a lot that goes into theology, and I appreciate all of that. A theology can't be built solely on biblical texts. Mm -hmm. But that also might mean that if they're serious about exegesis as their foundation, that sometimes when they talk about this piece of theology or the other one, uh, they're going to take a look at those passages again and be more careful perhaps about saying, wait, I know this text is traditionally used to support this theology, but it really doesn't. And so let's just weed that one out. And that doesn't change the theology. Um, if you end up weeding all of them out and then you say, okay, so why am I holding that theology? Well, you know, those are questions to ask. So for example, I would say the theology about the fall of Satan, that's one that I would say, I'm sorry, we've got nothing. Uh, nothing that we can establish that doctrine on. And that one we should hold a lot more loosely. Um, but, you know, that's that's an outlier in the end. Um, and so uh, that's the exception, not the rule. Um, we might talk about the um, Old Testament anticipation of the Messiah and the fulfillment of the messianic reign in Christ. And again, you might say, well, there's some passages that I was using from Old Testament. I really can't use those. Uh, but that doesn't affect the role of Christ as Messiah. And so that's what I would hope for, a little more exegetical nuancing uh, that was willing to, yeah, edit 
uh, the the proof texts. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, we've been talking with Dr. John Walton, uh, Wisdom for Faithful Reading Principles and Practices for Old Testament Interpretation. It's available now from, from InterVarsity uh, Press. And now I just love to just kind of pick your brain with questions I like to ask all of, uh, of my guests. And uh, the, the first one would be, you know, you've been so prolific, um, like what's next? Is there still a book left in you that you feel like you must write or maybe that you've even been afraid to write thus far in your career? I generally haven't been afraid to write books. I've done stuff that's controversial, but yeah, yeah. you're going to it's do good. important topics. You're going to be controversial. So I've never shied away from that. Um, I've generally not taken the path of writing books that publishers ask me to write. I write the books that I feel driven to write. Um, and so it's not like I've been putting anything off, uh, just waiting for the day. At the same time, never in my 40 years have I ever been without an, an idea for a book that I was working on. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really have to generate them. They just they just come to me and um, and then I work at writing them. So right now, Lost World of the Prophets is in press. Mm -hmm. uh, that'll be coming out in a few months. And that'll be another Lost World book uh, where we'll tackle some of the issues about uh, systematic eschatologies and how much we can really rely on those timelines and all of that. Um, I'm currently writing a book called Advances in the Lost World of Genesis, where I'm catching up after 15 years since the initial publication. There's not a revised edition. It is saying, okay, here's here's more thinking on the table. Here are more ideas. Here, here's how I've tweaked this or that. And even in maybe one or two places, here's where I think I would take a different position today. Um, so that's the one I'm currently writing. Uh, I'm also currently writing a Daniel commentary for the Nicot series, Erdman's, um, and that's going to be two volumes of Daniel commentary. Um, my co-author is Aubrey Buster, my colleague here at Wheaton, and so we're writing that together, and that'll be coming out. Uh, so a lot that I'm working on right now, and and I didn't think that I had any other ideas for books after those, but last week another idea came to mind, so I'm thinking about that. I love it, yeah, yeah. I, I love the books that you've written, honestly, because it's like I've gotten to the point. Um, I'm 54 now, but it's like uh, I've literally just uh, as I said, I was being dean. It's like I decided I'm I'm only going to write stuff that I absolutely love to write, and I even say, I mean, this doesn't always go with exegesis, but it's like I want to make I want to write a book that comes so much from the soul that it almost makes me cry when I write. Again, that's not exactly mm -hmm. the same stuff, but I, I love the fact that you've written the books that you've wanted to write. I just thank you for modeling that too and being curious. And you have written controversial stuff. You're going to write on Genesis one and <laughs> Adam and Eve and all that stuff. Yeah, you've uh, put yourself out there. So I, th I just think that's really awesome, and just appreciate your scholarship. Um, um, what are some, what keeps you grounded as a, as a Christian? Like what, uh, you know, do, do you like keep a rule of life or just typical habits that allow you to uh, keep a strong devotional life as you some, and sometimes go where angels fear to tread with your own, with your own scholarship? Yeah. Well, I'd say, of course, both my, my church and my wife uh, keep me grounded, but also my, my commitment to scripture. I mean, I'm in scripture every day and you might say, yeah, but that's professionally. To me, it doesn't make a difference. I'm in scripture every day and uh, I don't separate out. Well, now I'm thinking academically and now I'm thinking devotionally. You know, to me, they're they're one and the same. I don't want to allow my devotional reading to not be grounded in important methodology. That that would be foolishness. Likewise, um, I, I've i got plenty of um, inspirational and motivational ideas coming out of my academic work. So I, I don't find those as separate things. And so I'm, I'm in scripture every day. Um, I've been very much impressed um, over the years uh, with Brother Lawrence's Practicing the Presence of God as something that is a discipline that weaves throughout your day. Um, that you don't just ground things in a morning devotion or an evening devotion, 
um, but that it's something that you are aware of God's presence, um, not just, you know, on a couple times a day, but moment by moment. And I found that very meaningful uh, as, as I think about the things that I do. Um, it's very easy for me to have um, moments of prayer throughout the day, not just because I open my classes in prayer, but because I have students' needs and families' needs and uh, all of those things which are constantly before me. And I've often talked to my students about, you know, too often our prayers are uh, prayers of, of wanting. Uh, I want this. And they might be good things. Uh, I, you know, benefits. You know, I want my my friend's sickness to get better. I want, to, you know, I want to understand what you want me to do, uh, a school, a spouse, a job, whatever it might be. And so often our prayers are requests and we look for answers and we're praying for results. And um, as I think about it, um, you know, I'm, I don't think that's the best use of prayer, although it is a use of prayer, mm -hmm. um, that instead we ought to be thinking about who we are becoming and who God can help us to become. And so those prayers that say, I need to, I, I need to do better at this or that or the other thing. I need to get more serious about this or that. In that sense, the, um, the prayer isn't all about results um, and answers. It, you're, you're in a process. And um, as Sky Jatani would say in his, his book, if, what if Jesus was really serious about prayer? He says it's it's more about relationship than it is about results. And so I I've tried to factor those things into my my day by day life. Great. Yeah, thank you. That was a wonderful answer. And now here's the impossible question for a man who's got a wall of books behind him. Uh, like if you just outside of the Bible itself, like could you name two or three books that have really shaped you personally in your spiritual life? Or I mean, you can make that historical stuff, but like what would be the two or three books that really yeah. shape John Walton and the man he is outside of scripture? Well, there are several different ways to answer that. I mean, early on, I was shaped by surprise C.S. Lewis. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that was um, even in my junior high and senior high days reading C.S. Lewis. Favorite book of his, if one jumps out, I mean, or just all of them or? Yeah, all of them. Because okay. <laughs> they fair. all kind of work together. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, along the way, there have been different books that have kind of been prominent in various periods of my thinking. Um, recently, I've really enjoyed Ian Provan's book, The Reformation and the Right Reading of Scripture, um, which I found uh, very, very insightful and helpful. Um, so I could talk about those, you know, different periods of time and books that have been meaningful to me in those periods of time. At this point, for where I am now, if somebody asked who is the greatest influence in your thinking, I would actually say, this is going to sound really weird, it's my son. Um, we've written three books together. He's just finished his dissertation at St. Andrews on Genesis 2 through 4. Wow. And um, almost every conversation with I have with him blows my mind and changes my mind on certain things and helps improve my thinking. And I don't know anybody that's uh, impacting me more at this stage uh, than the things that he's writing and the things that we're talking about. I love that. My um, Both of my daughters are starting doctoral programs this fall. One's going to be a do medical doctor. The one's going to be a psychologist. But uh, wow, I would love when I'm seven, I think it was 71 or whatever you said you are, that uh, I want that to be true for me. So thank you. I love that. I think that's my favorite answer I've ever gotten. So thank yeah. you very much for that. That says a lot about you too. So as a father, so praise the Lord. Um, where's the best place for listeners to connect with you if they want to? Well, I mean, we've been talking about my books and of course that's, that's one way. Yeah. The other thing is I'm all over YouTube. Yeah. Um, I travel <laughs> a lot. I speak a lot. And, so you can go into YouTube and find all kinds of presentations that I've done because almost everybody, every place I speak, they record it and then they throw it up on YouTube or 
whatever. Um, so uh, that would be a way. Of course, you get a lot of repetition there because I'm often asked to talk about the same kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so uh, those are the two best ways to to connect with the things that I'm that I've been doing. Um, okay. Well, uh, well, Dr. Walton, it's been an absolute privilege to just pick your brain a little bit today and listen to some of your wisdom. Grateful for your work. I know the listeners uh, will be blessed by uh, the stuff that you even shared here and, uh, you know, best wishes on uh, wisdom for faithful reading and uh, the next uh, projects that you'll work on is uh, you've retired from faculty meetings. Yes. And from grading papers. Amen. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank you, everyone, for listening all the way to the end of this week's episode. Until next time, live by faith, be known by love, and be voices of hope in the world. Amen. <laughs>